Um, just moving on, if I may just change, change the subject slightly, um, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I, I'm often told, I often hear from Christians who say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they really took us much further back in time. You know, got much earlier manuscripts, and it confirms the Old Testament we always had. It's the same books, the same content. Isaiah is just the same. Jeremiah is just the same. Um, wow. Is a, is this true or not? I mean, what, what's what's really going on here? Or is it more complicated than that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very important it's a, a very important thing. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are huge, hugely important for all sorts of reasons. Mm. Um, not just not just the copies of the Bible, by the way, but also the they tells us a lot about this group of Jews who were in these kind of monastic like communities. Uh, the the Essenes, um, but some some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are biblical manuscripts, and they were a huge find. The reason is because the Hebrew Bible that we use today, the people who use the Hebrew Bible actually in Hebrew and that are mm -hmm. translating the Hebrew Bible are basing their uh, their translations on a manuscript that was written around the year 1000 of the Common Era. Mm -hmm. Around 1000 of the Common Era. It's, uh, it's, it came from Leningrad, and so it's called yeah, Codex Leningradensis. Mm -hmm. um, Jewish scribes in the Middle Ages, when they copied a manuscript, they would destroy it because now they had a perfect copy of it and they made sure the copy was perfect. Um, they had ways of doing that through the Middle Ages. The problem is what were scribes doing before the Middle Ages, before they had these rules? <laughs> well, we had to guess that they were getting it right. And so um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 and they, have, uh, they include portions of every book of the Hebrew Bible except for uh, except for the book of uh, Esther. Esther? Yeah. Um, because, yeah, it turns out God is not named in Esther, and so that, for some reason, that book's not among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of the scrolls we have are not complete scrolls. The oh. Isaiah scroll is a com virtually a complete scroll, and it is very, very close in wording to the Codex Leningradensis. Right. So that confirms so, uh, that, but that confirms the Bible we have today was historically yeah. accurate. It was accurately yeah, no, no. And transmitted. No, no, no. It's got nothing to do with it. And so I've got, so I need to explain several things here because there's several points right. that some people like overlook. <laughs> yeah. Which is the first one people overlook. That's true of the Isaiah scroll, but it's not true yep. of other Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh -huh. There are other Dead Sea Scrolls. The the scroll of Jeremiah that we have is um has a uh, has differences from our jeremiah and the differences from our jeremiah are like the differences that come to us from the greek translation of jeremiah in the septuagint in the greek greek bible that version of jeremiah is 15 percent shorter than the leningradensis 15 percent <laughs> uh so that's not very accurate <laughs> and no. so so it's not that everything is like the Isaiah scroll. The Isaiah scroll is like the Isaiah scroll, but it doesn't prove. That's why it's always that, mentioned, it's always showcased. Oh, look at Isaiah. Isaiah is exactly the same. Look at the perfection yeah, of no. transmission, the reliability. So that's, my, that's my first point. That this, yeah. this manuscript yeah. Isaiah was written a thousand years before Lenin Gudensis. It's accurate, but the others are not the same. Exactly. Second point um, Isaiah the prophet was writing, Isaiah of Jerusalem was living in the 8th century BCE. Um, so uh, that means we don't have any manuscripts for the first over 700 years. Mm. So the fact that you have a manuscript that from, say, say the year 1 to the year 1000, you can show that Isaiah was copied accurately. But our question is, what about between the year 700 BCE and 1? No, there's mm. 700 years. We have no evidence. Mm. In Hebrew, no Hebrew text. So you can't say this is exactly what Isaiah wrote. How would you mm. know how much it got changed between 700 and the, the Dead Sea Scroll copy? You, there's no way to know. Uh, there mm. are ways, not good ways to know. No. Um, so that's that's second. Third thing, even if, even if we had everything that was accurate in either any book of the New Testament or the New Testament or Old Testament, even if we had a manuscript, even if we had the original, suppose yeah. we had the original of Mark, or suppose mm -hmm. we had the original of uh, Joshua, we have the original, that would have no bearing on the question of whether it's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. It would only have a bearing on whether we know what the author wrote. So the way I usually illustrate this is we have, we have 
millions of copies of Mein Kampf. <laughs> and they are accurate. They, I mean, they, they might not be accurate with what Hitler actually wrote, but they don't, they don't have any differences. We know what the first printed copy looked like. Does that mean that it's accurate? No! <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's right. It just means you know what he wrote. The fact you know what somebody wrote doesn't mean that what they wrote is right. <laughs> That's a different thing. So those are three really big points that shows that this argument just doesn't hold. And any one of those three shows that they didn't hold. Three together, forget it. The fact it's, that it's, 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 it's even worse than that. It. Yeah, it's not worse than that because we give the example of Isaiah. It's now commonly accepted that, yeah, maybe the first 39 chapters of Isaiah were written by this prophet in Isaiah from downtown Jerusalem. But... It was added to by maybe yeah. a second scribe or maybe a third scribe or, or yeah. scribes. Yeah. So we don't yeah. even, even if you were to dig up uh, the book of Isaiah that we have it today from 500 years ago, or 600 years ago, it doesn't mean we had the prophet Isaiah's yeah. own words, which right. many scholars think were added to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very common to think that I, Isaiah, and it, there's really good reason for this. Isaiah of Jerusalem wrote most of chapter 1 to 39, and then someone 150 years later wrote 40 to 50, 55. 50, yeah, 55, then the other 56 and all. And so, you know, it's a compilation, uh, no matter what. But even if you have Isaiah's words, again, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that he's right. He might be right. I mean, he might be, <laughs> but that's a different, it's a different question. The fact you have an accurate manuscript is not evidence that what the person said is accurate. Mm, okay, that, that's fair enough. Um, if we can perhaps move on to the last part then. Uh, Christianity after the New Testament, or Christianities after the uh, New Testament. You've written a, a superb um, book here, After the New Testament, A Reader in Early Christianity, published by Oxford University Press, uh, which is a, a wonderful anthology of uh, texts from the early centuries of uh, the church, or the churches, I suppose. Um, to just to clarify a few things, uh, the traditional picture, one we get from the church historian Eusebius, for example, is that Jesus founded the church. The disciples were the pillars of the church. They went out, preached the message with Paul. And, and you know, yeah, the, the church encountered heretics and, uh, and problem groups and so on, what, what you might call the Ebionites or the Marcionites or the Gnostic or whatever you want to call them. But basically, Christ founded the church and it went through time, through history, right up to uh, the present day. But do we not now know that we see Jewish Christianity? We've got churches founded by Paul. We've got the Ebionites. We've got Marcion in the second century. Uh, and, and these are quite quite a wide spectrum of different Christian groups, all identifying as Christian. You know, these are people who believe what they believe is true. Um, firstly, this is astonishing, isn't it, when you really get the sense of the diversity, uh, the big differences between these christian groups and my second question connects to that which of these early movements most closely resembles do you think the faith of jesus own disciples if it's yeah. possible to make that connection yeah. yeah so again it's it's a very complicated issue and it's um so eusebius so eusebius uh, as many of you here is well, no, is was, is called the known as the father of church history. He's the first one to write a sketch of the history of Christianity from the time of Jesus up to his own day, around the year three hundred. So the first three hundred years of Christianity, and one of his he's got a lot of he's, he has a lot of motifs driving the, his work as he describes a lot of earlier authors and a lot of earlier views. He talks about persecutions and martyrdoms and heresies, and he you know he gives the history of the church church leaders. His view of the relationship of heresy and orthodoxy, uh, so mm -hmm. orthodoxy for him would mean the, the correct belief, the, 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 the true faith that, that, that people in his day had. Uh, and heresy would be a false teaching of some kind. His view was that Jesus taught orthodoxy to his disciples, taught, taught the, basically what we would think of as the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. He taught, he taught the truth to his disciples who passed it down to their successors, who passed it down to their successors. And there's always been this main body of truth right. that has held, or been the mainstream the whole time. It's always been the majority opinion. And every now and then you get some heretic coming along who is willful or mean-spirited or inspired yeah. by a devil. A who bad, say, uh, is motivated by bad intentions. They, they, they never good guys have just got a different idea. They're always malicious individuals, yeah. I've noticed. It's, they're malicious and demon-inspired. And they yeah. come up with something like they'll say, oh, actually, there are two gods. There's not one god, you know, or, or there are 36 gods, or salvation isn't by Christ's death. Jesus didn't even die. You know, they... 
and these are all offshoots. They're yeah. secondary offshoots from the mainstream that's always been there in yeah. Eusebius' right. presentation. Yeah. That view of Eusebius held all the way up to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, this is just what church historians said. So if you read a church historian from the 19th century, this is how they'll paint what happened in early Christianity. It all changed in, uh, in the 1930s with the publication by a German scholar named Walter Bauer, who wrote a book that his English translation is called Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. Bauer argued that if you actually look at the surviving evidence, region by region. So you look, you go to Egypt and you look at our oldest records of what Christianity was like in Egypt, or you go to Antioch up in Syria, or you go to Asia Minor, you go to these places where we actually have records. The earliest records in almost every place is something that later was called a heresy. Bauer argued that in fact, it wasn't that there was like this mainstream of orthodoxy with heretics coming off everywhere, that in fact, there were lots of different groups of Christians as far back as we have records, and they were fighting for converts. And eventually one of the groups ended up winning out and it got more converts and it wiped out the opposition and then it rewrote the history. And you, you see this is a rewritten version of what actually was the truth, which is that there was a wide diversity so Bauer, so that's Bauer's, that's Bauer's view. He came out with this in 1934. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't translated into English until the late 1970s. So a lot of, oh, English, really? you know, that a lot of English and American scholars didn't pay enough attention to it. But it has, it has become a, very much the critical opinion of the critical historians today. And it's interesting that archaeological discoveries have in almost every instance verified what he had to say. Before, so, I mean, for example, the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945, mm -hmm. just a year and a half before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Nag Hammadi Library are the Gnostic Gospels, as they're sometimes called, which, uh, you know, every time there's some kind of gospel that shows up, it's always something that is not orthodox. <laughs> you know, yeah, more yeah. recently, for example, the Gospel mm -hmm. of, of Judas. Yeah. And so... It looks like in early Christianity, there were these various views of things, and you can trace the diversity actually back into the New Testament. Just as you were talking earlier about Matthew and Paul having different views of the law, that's a pretty significant difference. And there, and everywhere, you know, almost every time Paul writes a letter, he's got these Christian enemies. <laughs> you know, he has more enemies than friends, and that's in his day. We don't have the writings of his enemies. No. <laughs> we wish we did. So the idea is it's very diverse all the way back.